be true crime. Can not be true. Hello, hello, everyone. I have to say, I am very, very stressed <laughs> right now. <laughs> Technology, it's not my strongest suit. Austin over in New York, we how long has it taken us to try and get this audio sorted for this particular episode of Too Good to Be True Crime? An, an impressively long time. We started. Uh, uh, we started at about eleven thirty. It's Mate, been about an hour. Nah. Oh God! You know what the thing is about <laughs> about about technology and recording. When I'm on the computer, most of the time when I sit in front of a cu- computer, this is what I want to say. What the fuck? Like regularly, because nothing ever seems to work. We've got some new audio equipment for the podcast, so we were excited, weren't we? I was like, I set it up. I set it up a good hour, a good hour before you and I even actually started talking. I'm like, right, I'm ready to go. And then we could hear too much ambient noise, too much whirring. It was too echoey. We could hear ourselves repeating in the headphones. Mate, it was a fucking nightmare. And, oh, I just... uh, (laughs) I just sent you before we started recording, mate. I'm trying really hard just to keep a lid, just to keep a lid on it, just to keep a lid on it right now, because I'm about to blow my top, and that's not good for anyone, is it? But hey ho, it happens, and it's good we can laugh about it, right? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh Rich, I'm sorry, buddy. It's another too good to be true crime. Welcome back to anyone that's listening, and thank you so much to everyone that's listened to uh, previous episodes. Like I said before, the one sentence that I loathe myself saying is, Oh guys, would you like and subscribe and give us a rating please? Oh, we're really desperate to get some listeners, please do that. I'm going to say it again, it's the only way to do it, isn't it mate? That's it. We've had some really nice listeners, so thank you for thanks for tuning in on our first couple episodes, everybody. And yeah. um, please keep listening. And uh, we're, you know, we're putting ourselves through hell just for your listening experience here. I, I thought I thought Rich was going to explode a couple minutes ago. So yeah, it's all right. And keep you know what? Us like, we, love. <laughs> like we said before, if you don't like it, don't slug it off. Just don't fucking listen to it. It's not for you, is it? Listen to something else. But if you do, please give us a rating. That would be amazing. We love you. Yeah, if you yeah if you click those little buttons, that'll help us. But don't slag it off. Yeah, don't slag it off, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's always very Dick Van Dyke, isn't it, when uh, Americans <laughs> do... Um... The thing is, we grow up with so much American television and so much, like, you know, Broadway musicals or whatever. So we're getting our, you know, a fix of, like, American accent regularly, regularly, regularly. So I guess we pick it up. Um, no, more so than, you know, what you have. I mean, do you have much British TV over there? I can't think off the top of my head, though, of too much, too much British TV I grew up with other than, yeah, Dick Van Dyke on Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that is your quintessential <laughs> British accent, isn't it? Hello there, Mary Poppins. <laughs> I love Dick Van Dyke, though. I love him. He's like your cuddly uncle, isn't he? That's you, right. You love, Dick, you love Dick Van Dyke. You can't not like Dick Van Dyke. He's yeah. like, oh, oh, I want him to be my uncle or my granddad. It's nice, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Mate, what episode are we on? Six? Episode six? Too Number good six. to be true crime. Mate, how, what's your week look like? I've not seen you for a while. How's your, um, what have you been up to? What's the weather like in New York? This is the first week of the season that I've had to wear layers. I've had really? To, yeah. I, I, honestly, I'm, it's exciting to me. It's getting a little bit chillier. It's got that, it's got that exciting energy, you know? I like that. I have to say... Because I always talk about the weather because I'm obsessed by it. Well, I'm I'm not obsessed by the weather. I'm obviously just obsessed by how shit it is in the UK majority of the year. But September's been really nice. And even now, today, we're at the back end of September. I went out today and I just had a t-shirt on and it was pleasant. And apparently it's going to be pleasant for the next couple of weeks. Which is nice because what that means is the winter is shorter, isn't it? Because mm. I hate... Listen, we want to live life. And I, I get... In the winter, I I think I suffer from that SAD, that SAD syndrome a little bit. Because you kind of think to yourself, every year you're like, right, let's just get through the winter. 
There's a lot of months to just get through, isn't there? You want to enjoy yourself still, but I find the weather, when it's so miserable, it's horrible. You know, I don't want to just get through stuff and shut the curtains and get on the sofa. I want to be doing stuff, and I find when it's raining and it's freezing cold, it's impossible to do that. You know what's even worse than that as well, though? I hate it when the weatherman or the weather woman stands there. What they should be doing is they should be sad for us. So when they say, oh, listen, it's going to be rainy. It's going to be <laughs> blowing a gale. I want them to be like, guys, I'm really I'm really sorry to have to deliver this information to you. And, I, and I'm really sorry that this is um, this is going to be kind of like detrimental to your plans at the weekend. And uh, but it is going to rain and it is going to be cold. And um, yeah, maybe it's best you stay indoors. Be nice about it instead of going, well, it's going to be rainy at the weekend. So you need to take some layers. Are you going to get wet if you stay there happy about it? No, I know it's not their fault. But at least give us the give us the bad news with a you know solemn. We're looking for more yeah. honesty from our from our and weather in people. Every weather report in the winter, I don't want to see a smile. <laughs> I fake. don't want to see a smile from the weather reporters. I want to see. So I want to see. I don't even want to see any bright colours. What they're wearing. I want them to be wearing kind of like dark suits or dark dresses or whatever they're wearing. And I want to see like you know kind of that mundane. That kind of I'm sorry attitude. That's mm. what I want to see. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, all the kids, though, I can see all the kids going back to school. They're in their little ski uniforms. Obviously, now my Instagram feed is just full of people going, oh, it's Freddie's first day at school. Doesn't he look cute in his school <laughs> uniform? I'm like, I don't want my feed being clogged up with that. The only person <laughs> that cares about that is the person actually putting the photograph <laughs> On Instagram. No yeah, one not else to cares. mention everyone's putting their kids' age and school that they go to and name all over the internet. Yeah, very good. Well, yeah, I know, but I don't want to. I don't want to see that. I'm like, listen, take the picture, show it to the grandparents. Don't put it on my Instagram feed. Don't want to see it. Unfollow immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember school? It's been a I while. Loved I loved it. I th that's why I like the fall because it always reminds me of the excitement of finding out what a new school year would hold. When you're an adult, it's a little bit harder. You don't always know when the next chapter is coming, but I just, I fucking love that shit. New school year, I, new teacher, new class, uh, everything. It's interesting that you enjoyed it because I think when when I used to start the new school year, the summer holidays seemed an absolute mammoth age away, to be honest. Like, oh, and you're like, God, it's so long until I've got six weeks off again. Those six weeks off now in the summer for the kids, they seem to go in a heartbeat. That's right. When you, yeah, to get there as a kid, you're like, oh God. You just literally, all you're doing is aiming to get, we have half term, which is like halfway through the term, there's a week off. Um, do you have a mid, yeah, is, you call it midterm, midterm yeah. break or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then it's Christmas, but um, yeah, at school, I'm seeing all the kids going to school. They, they, to be honest, they do look cute in their like little uniform, in their little uniforms and that. I, I, I maybe I'll retract my previous statement about Instagram. I just find it a bit annoying when I want to see like pictures of dogs like falling over and stuff, and I get a load of kids in their school uniform. But... Did you wear a school uniform growing up? No, well, we did, but we had like it was, you just had the option of wearing either grey, black, or navy blue like trousers or pants, as you guys call it. And then we had the option of wearing like a grey, black or a navy blue jumper. But if you didn't have the jumper on, you had to have a school tie, which is navy blue with yellow stripes. Yeah, mm. it's good. Not too bad. Did you? No, no school uniforms ever for me. Really? No. Did you go to Rydell High School? Uh, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I, I bet my high school is uh, just about what you would what you would picture from a, from an American high school, though. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine it probably. Do you know what I did? I was, I've got some friends that live in Chicago. And when I went to visit them, they took me to the school that f they filmed Ferris Bueller. Oh, brilliant. So I stood on those steps and then I had like it did like a picture and I did like it. I cut it in half. So half the picture was the teacher from Ferris Bueller standing on those steps. And the other half was me standing on those very same steps. That was very cool. That's pretty Middle cool. Middle of Chicago. Yeah, it was nice. I can't go Hughes. back and visit my school now. I can go Why? back and visit the outside, but when I first graduated from school, and I even I even remember while I was in high school, former students coming back and visiting, popping into the yeah. classroom and stuff. Yeah, you, you can't do that now because of school security, unfortunately. Oh, uh, I thought you were going to say because once you'd left, they banned you from ever returning. They almost they almost banned me. No, Rich, I almost pulled like a really fucking epic senior prank. Did you? It's like, yeah, we <clears throat> we were pretty close. And I think I can be grateful that uh, that we hit the snags that we did. 
Mm. But um, yeah, this was incredible. Okay, I'm going to tell you about this because it, it sort of has to do with our story today. So yeah, my best friend in high school, his brother is a couple years older than us, maybe like seven years older than us. And his brother was Mr. Popular in school. And so... It was Danny um, Zuko. He was, he was da- the Danny Zuko. Yeah, he was the Danny Zuko of the school for sure. Um, and, you know, he was at school uh, seven years before us, so security was even more lax then. I'm sure they were just walking out in the middle of the day and going to restaurants and stuff. So we have this after school, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? It was kind of like um, a male beauty pageant, and it was a fundraiser for the senior class. And I was a part of this, and so that brought me to school after hours. Yeah. And my friend's brother said, oh, you're at school after hours. You should check out the bomb shelter that's underneath the school. The bomb shelter? And yeah, because my school was built, uh, yeah, my school would have been built in those in those World War years that bomb shelters were put everywhere. Yeah. So we're like, wow, what do you mean? Like, bomb shelter under school? Tell me about it. And so he says, you go to the old auditorium. Not the new auditorium, but the old auditorium underneath the stage. If you go down the stage left staircase and you get to the bottom, you'll look straight ahead and you'll see a door that looks like it has a lock on it. But you can really just lift the lock right off the latch. It's not going to be locked. And then you'll go into this little room. It'll be really dark. And about 20 feet in front of you on the left, there's going to be a filing cabinet. You move the filing cabinet over and you'll see a wooden door that's only about waist high. And that will get you into the bomb shelter. We're like, wow, there's a fucking bomb shelter underneath our school. Obviously, (laughs) we're going to investigate this. So we have our little, you know, our our fundraiser rehearsal thing after school one day. And um, I wasn't... I wasn't going to tell anybody else about it. And my, my friend whose brother had shared the story with us, he was not in the fundraiser. So here I am all by myself in the old auditorium where there's probably, you know, ghosts of, of students past. And I go down the stage left staircase, super dark down there. And I see a door right where he says there would be a door, but there's a lock on it. I lift the lock right off the latch. It's unlocked, just like he said. I open it, I get, a, I get a flashlight, whatever it was, on my cell phone or something. And sure enough, about 20 feet in front of me, there's a filing cabinet on the left. And I'm just, like, shitting myself. I go, I go back up, I grab someone else that was at the fundraiser, so now I have a buddy just in case. We push the filing cabinet over, and there's a fucking tunnel. It's waist high, and I can't even see the end of it. Wow. So we, we went down there, we investigated it, like there was some old like band trophies and stuff down there. You could tell some kids had, had found their way down there prior. And, yeah. And so uh, once we found out about the bomb shelter that only we knew about, we, we planned a pretty elaborate prank. And I suppose I can't go into all the details, but essentially we were going to take some artwork from around the school and hide it in the bomb shelter. I think we also had planned to pick up someone's desk, uh, maybe the principal's desk or something, hide it in the bomb shelter. We couldn't get in trouble. We didn't remove the property from the from the school, you know? Yeah, man, it was legit. We were ready to go. This was my senior year. I was on top of the world. And my grandma came to visit because it was the end of the year. She was going to see my graduation. I, obviously, I had to share with my grandma, who's cool as shit. I had to share with her the prank. <laughs> And she's taking it all in, just like you are now, Rich. And she looked at me and she said, listen to me. You have to promise me you will not do that. And if you don't promise me, I will tell your parents. Right. This was a completely out of left field for my grandma. I thought she was going to be down for the cause. Yeah. She goes, I thought you were going to say, you can only do this if you take me with you. (laughs) 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 all right grandma we're gonna do the prank let's go you're coming with she says she looks me in the eye and goes and if you promise me that you won't do it and you do it anyway you will have lied to your grandmother Ooh. so there it was there was my ultimatum so thanks to grandma yeah i think it is thanks to grandma before i left school i had to impart this knowledge to the younger students so i told a couple younger guys yeah and um they got in trouble they got caught did they? They followed the bomb shelter tunnels all through the school, and it brought them to a janitor's closet. 
<laughs> and when they walked out of the janitor's closet, somebody saw them and they got caught. Janitor, that is a caretaker for you British listeners. Is it? A custodian? Yeah, yeah basically looking after things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And does grandma remind you of that every Christmas? She's never reminded me of it. No, mm. I'll be interested. Yeah. To, I'll be interested to hear from her after the podcast drops because you know she's our number one listener. Absolutely, and she didn't want to come and visit you in some kind of state penitentiary, did she? Yeah, it's exactly. In your, in your orange jumpsuit, she didn't. She didn't want that for you. Yeah. So then you uh, you moved to New York in pursuit of Broadway. I made it out. Yeah, I made it out of a life of crime. Oh uh, guys, would you like and subscribe and give us a rating, please? And uh, we're really desperate to get some listeners. Please do that. But I got a really good story for you today, Rich. Um, nice. And it's about a group of college students, you know, uni students. Okay. They didn't have really anything to snag their plan. Right. So they decided to go through with it. Oh, they did. This is really an incredible story. Let's hear it. And it starts in Kentucky. You ever been to Kentucky? Never been. Never been to Kentucky. Describe where that is. Kentucky is, uh, it's, it's about smack dab in the, well, I guess it's not smack dab in the middle of the States. It's closer to the, uh, to the Eastern part of the United States, but it is one of our landlocked States. So it's in the middle. Is it near, uh, is it near Kansas? It's further East than Kansas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in Kentucky, there's a university called Transylvania. University. Too fucking good to be true. Crime. In 1988, there was a a trademark dispute. It got pretty nasty. Hallmark was putting out cards right. for Halloween with Dracula on yeah. it. Yeah. That said, Transylvania University. And Transylvania University didn't like that. So there was a, a trademark dispute, and uh, and Hallmark pulled all of their unsold Transylvania University merch. And that's our crime yeah. for today. Pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> okay, so now our our real our real crime takes place in 2004. All right, we're we're in the 21st century here, and we're gonna start off with this art student at Transy. His name is Spencer. Uh, Spencer's on an art scholarship, and he's just a young you know a, a young middle class white kid at at Transylvania yep. University there to study art. Spencer has a buddy named Warren. Warren. Warren is not the kind of person that your parents wanted you to hang out with. Right, okay. If you catch my drift. Yeah, I understand. Warren has a tattoo of a T-Rex on his shoulder. How old are these guys? Uh, These guys are like 19. Okay, so they're right. I was going to say, because what's the legal age in the States for having a tattoo? 18? Hmm... Yes, probably. Okay. But uh, if you see Warren's tattoo, he might have done it himself. Right. It's, it's anyone's <laughs> guess, you know. Right. Um, Warren's tattoo is a T-Rex. It's on his shoulder. And the T-Rex, because it has really small arms, cannot reach the ceiling fan that is also tattooed on Warren's shoulder. A T-Rex and a ceiling fan. Too fucking good to be true. But he can't reach it, obviously, because he's a T-Rex. He has short arms. Yeah. Right. But he's trying. All right. So we're painting a picture here of, of Warren. This is the kind of guy that, that Spencer, the art student, is hanging out with. Uh, Warren recently had a failed operation making fake IDs. Right. And they kind of needed, you know, something else to do. Uh, um, Warren was on a soccer scholarship. Yeah. He was a soccer player. Okay. Okay, football for you over there in the UK. Not the biggest game in the US at the moment, but you are getting some fantastic players that are making their way over to the US, like Lionel Messi at the moment, playing for Inter Miami. Still not the biggest sport there, though, is it? You've got um, American football. That's right, yeah, American football. Which always amazes me, considering you call it football, and yet you throw it with your hands. Never understand that. <laughs> yeah. Please so continue. So Warren and... So Warren and Spencer are just kind of shooting the shit. They're 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 in yeah they're in towards the end of their semester there, and they're just kind of bored. And um, what do we do with our lives? I want to be an artist. What do I make art about? You know. 
And so I'm going to send you now. We're going to do something new on the podcast, Rich. We're going to do a cold read. Okay. Richard is going to read a message here that I'm going to send him, which is a quote from Warren. Okay. And you're going to introduce us to the crime that Warren and Spencer decided to get into. Okay. Give us your best university stoner accent. Oh, God. Here it comes on your WhatsApp. Has it got to be American? My, my accent? Okay, uh, let's have a look. I don't know. Give us your best. Is it so? What stoner accent? Like, hey there, dude. Is it like that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Hey there, That's buddy. Uh, right. Okay. So, so this is I'm as Warren. Am I right now? That's right. It's arrived. Let's go. Okay, buddy. So we're sitting in the car smoking weed, and then Spencer said, "I just took a tour in that library, and there's shit sitting there you wouldn't believe." They said this set, Birds of America, sold for twelve million dollars. I said, $12 million just sitting there. They got security around that. So I kind of go, that would be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? He said, yeah, that would be kind of crazy. And then I said, you know, why don't you look into, into it more and we'll go from there. I really have no idea what any of that is about, to be honest, mate. And probably my terrible like d um display of american stoner accent i think you i think you it nailed was a cold, it it was a cold read first time I've it was a cold read it's not easy first man. time i've ever seen it yeah all right so what you just shared with us which is what warren shared in his vanity fair interview wow is that they were sitting in a car smoking weed and spencer says dude the library at transy university has a rare book room where there are incredibly valuable books being right. kept there under very low security. Okay. So now pulling from the Transy website, the rare book room houses the Clara Peck collection of books. Right. Highlights of this collection include, this is the big one, um, Audubon's Birds of America. So this is a book of, of essentially paintings that an artist named Audubon went around the U.S., and tried to paint all the birds that he could see, all the, right. all the birds that were in the U.S. So, and then he compiled those paintings in a book, and so that's one of the very valuable items. They've also got, um, they've also got a Charles Darwin, uh, what is it, on, on the Origin of Species, I believe is the book. So they've just got really old, like really early edition, you know, books that are just worth millions of millions. Yeah. And, and Spencer, the art student, having taken a tour of the library, not only knows the value of these books, but he knows what it takes to get access to the books. And the only thing guarding the books are a librarian yep. and a guest book. A gu <laughs> right. So you've got to have the librarian open the door for you to get into the rare books room. And you've got to sign the guest book. And then it's all yours. Yeah. So they're seeing these very valuable books and how easy it yeah. is. And just like, just like senior in high school me, seeing the opportunity... They, they start planning. So Spencer's an art student. He, um, he, he creates like a blueprint of the building. They, they, they have plenty right. of access to this building. So they're spending their time pacing the building to get the steps right and everything. Make sure that they have an accurate blueprint of the building. And, you know, I think um, at, at some point Spencer probably wasn't taking this very seriously but was still kind of going along, seeing where, where this adventure would take them. Yeah. But Warren said to him, hey, I found a contact, someone who can buy our stolen goods. <laughs> but if they're really expensive books, and they're, if they're like first editions, even trying to palm those off onto someone else, they're, they're going to be flagged up as being, hey, this is, you know, this is an important book, and where did this come from, surely? My thoughts, exactly. But, mm. but Warren apparently has a contact now that will buy right, these stolen okay. goods. He's the man in the know. Yes. So, you know, he was in the fake ID I industry, and so he's yeah. got the connect. So Yeah, he's got they... his self, self tattoo business. He's like, he knows what he's doing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Br brilliant, exactly. So they take a trip from Kentucky to New York. Right. This is an hours-long road trip. This is not a short road trip. They go to New York City. Yeah. So they can meet this contact outside, yeah. you know, on the south of Central Park. I love it there. They, they've been given a description of a guy and they hand him uh, an envelope. Warren hands him an envelope of cash 
and receives a business card. And the business card is the email address to the actual person who will be buying their stolen goods. Right. So now they've made their way all the way to New York and paid $500 just to get another contact. It's a chain. It's a chain. So they go back to their hotel. They reach out to the contact. The contact gets back to them and says, I am happy to meet with you, but I only do so in person. Yep. Whenever you are in Amsterdam, I'll be happy to meet with you. Oh, Amsterdam. They've got to go to Amsterdam. They've got to go to Amsterdam. Okay. The story, the legend has it, um, that Warren spent 1200 bucks, 2000 bucks on a plane ticket to Amsterdam. Yeah. And he went to Amsterdam on his own. Was this pre, pre-low-cost airlines? Probably. Um, so he goes, to, he goes to Amsterdam. He claims that he met with the buyer. And the buyer was a bit disappointed that he didn't have the books already. They, haven't, they don't have the books. They're trying to make sure yeah. they've got someone to buy them. But, yeah. but the buyer says, if you, as long as you get the book appraised, as long as you get the, the material appraised by a, a reputable auction house, we're happy to buy it. Right. So they're thrilled. Warren returns back to the United States and tells his friend Spencer, hey, man, we're good to go. I got us, I, I got us the connect. The deal is done. Yep. So they, they look for some auction houses and they settle on Christie's auction house in New York City. Yeah, yeah it's a big one. Major auction house in the New York yeah. City. And so that becomes their plan. Once we get the stolen books, we're going to bring them to Christie's. The plan is set, but they need two more people to help. They need a lookout and they need a getaway driver. Oh man, it's a full on operation, isn't it? It's a full-on operation. But I don't understand why they need a getaway driver. For for what reason? Surely if they're just bringing the books, handing the books over, getting them auctioned, and then that's essentially they're making their money that way, why do they need these other variables? So um, the library, the rare books room, does not permit you to take books out of the rare books room. Ah, uh, You can go look at them there in a glass okay. case. Yeah. So basically what they right, but they and if they go in, they have to sign their name in the guest book to say who's gone in there. So if anything goes missing, they know. That's right. how we how easy is it to sign a false name? Could you sign a false name? Sure. Yeah, could easily yeah. do that. But I guess if they're going in there regularly to check out these books, that means that the librarian that's in charge of them is noticing these people because there can't be that many people going in in there regularly. So if they're going in and out, in and out, suddenly something goes missing. Surely they're going to be number one suspects immediately. That's right. And I should also add that the Audubon book, which was, you know, they had a couple they had a couple books on their list of what they were going to go for. But the Audubon books, there was a series, a collection. Those were the biggest payday, the most valuable. And yeah. they are a, about the size of a coffee table each. They're quite oh. large and heavy. Also, can we just talk a minute about a guy that's called Autobahn? I mean, it is mum name him Autobahn. Is that his first name or his second name? It's his it's his it's his surname and it's, it's Audubon with a D. Audub What's his first name? Like Tim Audubon. Oh gosh, now I should know. Well I, I yeah. wanna say that it's I, I wanna say that it's Jonathan. Jonathan Audubon. It's a very strange Audubon. name. Audubon I've never heard Oops. that name ever from anyone. Because I was thinking Autobahn, which is the German name for motorway isn't it or it's fruit? yeah it's john j audubon's birds yeah. of america that is okay. the that's the that's the series of of, of paintings here it's a huge name. book well you couldn't carry it on your own any of the books and there's a series right. about five of them okay and it's huge right yep so they've done all this research on how they're going to conduct their theft their heist and the research consisted of Getting stoned and watching every heist movie that they could find. <laughs> Too fucking good to be this is not. I'm not kidding. Because they can actually incorporate probably two of their favorite things as students: getting stoned and watching TV. Right. That's it. So yeah. I mean, you can imagine all along how this plan. It, you know, especially Spencer might be thinking, oh, we're not really going to go through this. We're just like getting stoned and looking for an excuse to watch movies, and you know, yeah. like it's you know. But they they find they find the two other two two other people that are needed for their operation, and um, we know all these people's names, but we've already given you a couple, and I'm going to use the code names that Warren decided to use for the operation to introduce you to Mr. Black, who is the lookout, right, and Mr. Pink. 
who is the getaway driver. Which is basically ripped off from Reservoir Dogs, probably, isn't it? Straight off. And just yeah. like in the movie, when Mr. Pink got named Mr. Pink, he was not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pink was brought on the operation because he had the most money. He was he was uh he was the richest out of the four of them. And yeah. and they knew that with his parents uh he would have access to a getaway vehicle and perhaps yeah. some funds that they needed for their various, you know. And also he's like probably like a trust fund kid kind of like pushing the boundaries because his parents are like, you know, probably want him to be like a lawyer or a doctor and he's not interested and he's look he's looking for a way to kind of, you know, repel what they want him to do. Bingo. Exactly. Yeah. So there's four of them now. And their plan is set. On December sixteenth of two thousand four, yeah. they planned yeah. at the end of the semester after finals so that the campus would generally be empty. They embark on their plan. The four gentlemen, they don old man makeup, beards, <laughs> hats, fake hair. Yeah. They wear suits and and yeah. you know, like a like a long coat. This is proper like Mission Impossible shit, isn't it? When he has like the plastic mask and everything. You it's just it's like it makes you go well, this is exactly what it would feel like if, if I was a student trying to pull off this heist. Yeah, because you know damn well that they hadn't got those, you know, those disguises from anywhere sort of reputable. That would have been down the local party shop where you get your Halloween costume from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Probably draw more attention to themselves looking like that than they would if they were just dressed as students. Mm, put a pin in that thought, Rich. We'll bring that back up in a second. Okay. They could not get a hold of the car that they were going to use. They couldn't get a hold of it, so they had to use someone else. Uh, they had to use Mr. Pink's mom's uh, Dodge Caravan. <laughs> um, the stun guns that they had ordered. Yes, it was part of the plan to use stun guns on the librarian, unfortunately. Oh. I feel so. Is it was it a woman the librarian? It was a woman. We will talk about her because I would not be able to tell this story on the podcast without checking in on her and oh. hearing what she thinks about the whole thing and making sure she's okay. I feel sorry for her already. I just imagine these two students like shooting her with some kind of taser or something, and her being on the floor like, oh, bless her. That's right. But the stun guns didn't arrive on time. They were late in the mail, so. They're, they're, they're the morning of, and they haven't got the right car, and they haven't gotten their stun guns. So they sort of scramble to get their act together, and Warren goes out and buys a stun pen, a, a Cobra stun pen. <laughs> All right? And he had, he had Spencer zap him and Eric to test its power beforehand. <laughs> Did it knock him out? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't know. Um, and then when they finally get to the school... They can't find a parking space in the library. Okay, so just nothing is going according to plan. No. The boys the boys go inside the library in their old man makeup, and everyone is staring at them. Yeah. They try to play it cool. I forgot to mention they had, under a false name, sent an email and made an appointment with the librarian right. to view the books at this time. Okay. So they head up to the rare books room, and the library the librarian is in there with a group of people also looking at the books. Oh, right. She's not alone. Mm. So they abandon the plan. Yeah, unexpected. Unexpected, they abandon the plan. What a shame. And they all, they all think, well, that's it. And I'm sure Spencer, if he was anything like me, is thinking, oh, actually, it might not be so bad that we didn't go through with this. Maybe this yeah. is for the best. Hey, but no worries. Because Warren pops up and says... Hey guys, we're all set. I've made another appointment with the librarian tomorrow at four. I've <laughs> oh double checked God. that no one else will be in the rare books room. She has no other appointments at that time. Oh, Warren, he's uh, it, mate. He he wants this to happen, doesn't he? He needs this. It's back on. Yeah. Warren claimed to everyone that he would be the only one to deal with the librarian. Of course, as the day you know pans out. Things do start to go to plan. They did not show up in their old man makeup this time. Uh, just just looking like regular old students. And um, they're waiting for the call from Warren. He's gone up to meet the librarian, and they're waiting for the call from him that he has disabled the librarian. <laughs> Warren calls Mr. Black, who was supposed to be uh, helping pack up everything. 
And when Mr. Black gets up there, the librarian answers the door. He's thinking, Warren, you were supposed to take care of this. I was not supposed to be dealing with this. And the librarian mm. has answered the door. She's just fine. Come on. So, um, you know, Mr. Black is introducing himself, really thrown off, ve probably, you know, very, uh, very serious and nervous, sweating bullets, introduces himself under another name. And as he's signing the guest book, Warren zaps the librarian. <laughs> On Lesser. the arm. Her name. Her name is B J Gooch. Okay, B J Gooch. There it is. <laughs> it really and we is don't even name. need to. We don't even need to talk about that name. <laughs> Too it fucking says, good it, to it says it all that. right there. So B J Gooch was grabbed by the arms and zip tied her her arms, her legs. There was duct tape placed over her mouth, oh, and they placed a blindfold over her head. It's not good. This mm. is the darkest part of this story, and okay. it's really unfortunate. Oh. Okay? She's, she, she was fine afterwards. She suffered no bodily harm. She mm. was obviously traumatized by the situation. Massively. Poor old lady. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, we'll, we will be checking back in with BJ Gooch. Ms. Sure. Gooch. So, the two of the boys have made their way into the rare books room. Yeah. They scramble to find the keys for the, the glass case, but eventually they do. And they're just very haphazardly throwing books that they can find into their backpack. Yeah. Until they eventually get only a few of the Audubon books, not the whole collection, but just a few of them. They put them in a pink sheet and they take their planned exit route, which is out the service elevator of the rare books room. They really plan yeah. this out. They're going out the other elevator. Yeah. They take, they take it down to the basement, and they realize that the fire exit they thought they could use, the, the lights are off in the basement. They can't mm. get out the basement, mm. so they've got to go out the front door. Right, which is not what they planned. It is not what they planned. You have two students dressed as if they're business execs. They don't belong there. They're carrying a sheet with... It's as big as a coffee table. These books are huge. So they're going out the main door, and a libra another librarian hears the ding of the elevator and turns and sees them. They've got gloves on and everything. They're obviously trying to get out. So they start running with these huge, heavy books... And, and the librarian gives chase. Yes. This is what we want. This is the kind of action that we're hoping for. Now, yeah. the librarian giving chase is not BJ Gooch. She is just getting herself out of her restraints. She was partially unrestrained when she was found uh, yeah. just minutes later. But since the librarian gave chase, the boys tried to run, and it just didn't go so well. You know, right. Even though Warren was a soccer player, I don't know. It just didn't work out so well. They dropped the Audubon books. Right. The big prize of the day, they dropped, the, they dropped it. Mm. They get out to the getaway car, and they're, they, they've lost their treasure. And they almost cause an accident as they're leaving campus. And I, I believe, you know, the, the librarian's, like, you know, banging on their car and stuff, trying to get them to stop. And then, as they're leaving, they realize, we were grabbing random books and throwing them into our backpacks. So yeah. they look into their backpacks and they have two very valuable books, one of them being the Charles Darwin evolution book. So they got lucky. So they got lucky. Yeah. Mr. Pink in a um Mr. Pink in an unexpected move drops the other three guys in the hood. He right. drops them in a random neighborhood. Yeah. And says people are going to be looking for uh, for you know four guys in a, in a van and it's gonna look too suspicious why don't you guys just hang here and i'll come pick you up later yeah i'll swing Quick. around i'll swing around so they almost get mugged while they're in the hood there's like people <laughs> there's like people chasing them and did final, they have the books with them yeah they in their backpacks in the, yeah. right not left in the van okay no. and so uh, eventually uh, mr pink comes back in another car and and picks them up and they've got their books they've 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 done it so they, they bring the books back to Mr. Pink's house. They hide them there, and they yeah. just kind of sit on their laurels for a bit. They're just transfixed by this news coverage of the transy, as it is called, the Transylvania University book heist. Yeah. So I found a news article that says Transylvania University offers reward in the case of stolen books. Yeah. $5,000, no questions asked. 
that's not that much considering what they're worth, is it? You'll be you're thinking to yourself, if you've got what how many have they got? Two books, two, three books now? Yeah. They're gonna be worth what? Upwards of you know, in the six figures. And they're only yeah. offering five thousand dollars reward. Yeah. You'd hold on to those, surely. I think so. So obviously the FBI picks up on this case. The FBI very quickly. Very quickly. Oh, it's gone national. It's gone national. The FBI gets the the email address from mm. BJ Gooch that they mm. used to reserve time in the rare books room. Yeah. And so the FBI then requests um, it's, it was a Yahoo email address. Remember those right. Yahoo? So the FBI requests Yahoo release all the information from this email address. And, mm. uh, I, I, of course things just take a couple weeks. So while that's happening, the boys take a trip to Christie's in New York city with the books. Mm. They go into Christie's. They've made an appointment under a false name. There's two of the boys in there. Spencer, who's an artist, right? Because he'll be able to talk art with the people at Christie's and then Warren, because he's the mastermind behind the whole plan. Yeah. They've told the folks at Christie's, we are coming on behalf of our employer who owns a very rare collection of books, and we would like to get these books appraised. Yeah. But when they show up to Christie's, the gentleman who is the only one with the credentials to appraise the books officially is not there. They're instead left with a, a, an assistant. And so the assistant, you know, does does her thing with them. She's she gave an interview and said, yeah, it was really bizarre because these boys were like they were like 19 year old boys dressed like business execs. Like they just didn't belong. They were very suspicious. Mm. And so, you know, they go through the appraisal and everything. And she says, this is great. Unfortunately, you know, my boss isn't here. You'll have to leave your information. Yeah. So they they uh, they leave their phone number with the woman at Christie's and they await her call. They're at like a hotel somewhere in, in Manhattan. And um, it wasn't long before someone realized that the, email, that the phone number they gave to Christie's was Spencer's actual phone number. Right. Okay. So they knew I they... Mean, they must know at this point as well, because if the story's gone national, there must be a lookout for these books as well, surely. Sure. Well, their plan was to take the books right away the next day so that it would be too early for it to be put in the database. Right. Okay, fine. But the FBI were on it straight away. They turned up in their suits and their dark glasses and that's it with the FBI were taken over. That's right. Yeah, exactly. They've, they've left their actual phone number at Christie's. They didn't leave the hotel phone number. They gave his <laughs> actual phone number at Christie's. They've made their way all the way to New York with these millions of dollars of stolen books and they slip up and give their actual phone number to Christie's. So when the rookie FBI, mistake, rookie freaking mistake, when yeah. the FBI actually really, or when the FBI gets a hold of the Yahoo um, email account, yeah. they can then see that email was sent to Christie's. Yeah. They contact Christie's. They get the phone number from these two suspicious men trying to auction off these books. And when they call the number, the voicemail says, Hey, this is Spence. <laughs> <laughs> hey there dude this is spencer man leave me a message and i'll finish my brewski and get back to you Too fucking good to be true so the fbi they they start staking out they start you know surveilling these guys and the gentleman uh on one of the days before they were arrested they went out to see oceans 12 in the theater oh and they're openly talking about their heist in the theater and the fbi with their surveillance equipment can hear the whole thing so they actually think they probably actually think they're part of the oceans 12 setup don't they, they oh, we've done it we're just the same as them we're just as cool as them except they're just some dirty students that just nicks a few bits and pieces that's right they they are even quoted as saying it was really interesting for us like watching oceans 12 because we could relate so much to all the places <laughs> they were in and you know <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that's essentially our story they get yeah. raided by the police the police yeah. find everything written down everything yeah. was written down stored mm. next to the books with the stun guns which eventually came in the mail yeah yeah and um and and they were left in a duffel bag in mr pink's basement yeah which they knew or they thought would be safe there because mm. it was also where he was growing his marijuana plants <laughs> God, multiple crimes. So to be honest, what it's saying is that as as diligent as they were organizing everything, that actually ended up being their downfall because there was a paper trail of everything. The stupidest thing you could do, there was a paper trail of all of their plan. 
including which books they planned to steal. Right. Right. Everything. So okay, they they had they had staked out like okay, this person, is, this security guard is on duty on this day at this hour, like everything. Yeah, they knew all four boys plead guilty to six counts. A federal grand jury indicted them. Okay, the six wow. counts that they pled guilty to were conspiracy to commit robbery mm. with a maximum term of twenty years in prison. Twenty years. Wow. Aiding and abetting robbery, a maximum of 20 years. Conspiracy to commit offenses against the United States, a maximum of five years. Mm. Aiding and abetting the theft of objects of cultural heritage, 10 years. Aiding and abetting transportation of stolen goods, 10 years. And aiding and abetting possession and concealment of stolen goods, 10 years. Yeah. That is a lot of years. A lot of years... Yep, and they all pled guilty to all six, uh, all six counts. But it, they did make an appeal, and I'm going to tell you what their appeals were. There was two appeals. One of them was that the stun gun which was used was not a dangerous, deadly weapon. It could not have killed someone, the stun gun. Right, the stun pen, the pen that they used. The st- that's right, yeah, yeah, the stun pen, yeah. I should say. Yeah. That appeal didn't go down so well. Right. And the other appeal was, well, look, our charges should only be based on the books that left the building. Mm. We dropped the Audubon books in the stairwell of the of the building. We didn't steal those. We dropped them. They stayed in the building. Right. That appeal also did not go so well. Yeah, because there it was one of the charges was was planning to steal stuff, right? That's right. And like and like we just said, you know, they they had it all written down. They had it all planned. Now, Rich, yeah. one of the things I couldn't figure out, I, I, I really did do my due diligence. I read through court documents. I tried to figure out why they were not charged with assault. Yeah, with on BJ Gooch. On, on poor BJ Gooch. What I did find was that she, um, she, she sued them. Like for trauma or... Yeah, so she, 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 I guess, kind of sued them on her own. And then there was an out-of-court settlement. Right, okay. Which they paid for with the money they made from selling the books. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, certainly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, th- those are their those are their charges. Yeah. And those are their maximum sentences. This, they're massive, massive sentences, aren't they? That's the maximum, though, isn't it? That's the maximum. Yeah. And while on our podcast we usually decide on our own whether the criminals are guilty or not guilty. Yeah. They've decided for us they've written their plan down they've been caught and they pled guilty so rather than us try to speculate as to whether or not they're guilty i would like you rich to make some determinations on how long you think these 19 year old 20 year old boys should spend in jail well for a start i definitely think bj gooch should get her day in court with them as well because they they've physically assaulted her they've they've gaffer taped her mouth shut they've tied her up with cable ties and there was no charge in a court of law and she knows these guys as well she they've seen her like regularly in in the school in the library and they didn't ha- seem to have any care for her well-being or safety whatsoever it would have been better to go right one of us we will like distract her and we'll ask her to show us something whilst they try and remove the books. But to actually go full throttle and actually try to knock her out with one of these pens, tie her up and then gaffer tape her out. That's poor, poor lady. I feel sorry for, for BJ Gooch. I, f- I feel more sorry for her for having that done to her than I do feel sorry for her for being actually named BJ Gooch, if I'm totally honest. <laughs> I know it really is a shame. Her name is that's... her name is Betty Jean, but her nickname around right. the school was BJ. And BJ and Gooch. one of the of course, obviously, and one uh, and uh, one of the thieves while they were tying her up said, "Quit squirming, BJ. It will it will only make things worse." Something like that. And so she she knew that it was someone who knew her because they yeah, that's used terrible. her nickname of of BJ. Yeah, so it's a shame because like you want it when you know certain thieves honor amongst thieves and stuff like they they don't hurt anyone you know what i mean if right. you're gonna if you're gonna be a thief don't don't hurt anyone 
at the end of the day, I think that's terrible, and I think they yep. should all face the. I think they should face the maximum sentence for that, for assault, for yeah. um, for ki- to kidnapping, um, and you know, and kind of trauma to an old lady as well. That's awful. Absolutely, um, and she and and Bj Gooch said like it was the emotional trauma that was so hard for me. I thought I could go back to work, and then I had to take time off because I had been working in that small room for so long. That was another home to me. That was a place of safety for me. Yeah, and it would be like someone breaking into my house so emotionally yeah. it was very difficult she did testify against she had to get up on the stand and you know um yeah cross-examined yes cross-examined thank you so she yeah i mean she did do that and i won't i believe that so what i can read from the court document is that um uh during their sentencing the federal prosecutor asked for 11 to 14 years for each of them um and the severity of the requested sentences was predicated on dual propositions that although Audubon volumes had never been physically removed from the library, they were nonetheless stolen. And it was also predicated on the fact that the black Cobra stun pen uh, not only inflicted physical harm, but was actually a dangerous weapon. Yes. Okay. So, so there were charges pursued or um, what does it say? Um, Recommended sentences or requested sentences, and yeah. I'm sure through the the ins and outs of the law process, they decided that the best way was for them to settle that out of court for whatever reason. So she get more out of it that way instead of seeing these. I mean, to be honest, as well, they as much as they wrote everything down and they planned everything, they didn't really execute what they planned particularly well, did they? It's, it's true. Do you know what I mean? That at the end of the day, they're just a bunch of stoner students. To be honest, from what you said about Warren and Spencer, and then the other two, Mr. Pink and Mr. Black, Warren seems to be the one. There's always one that's a little bit crazy, isn't there? He's the one that's like trying to drag him on. No, we, you know, he's, he's always the one that's going to be like, hey, listen, we're not going to hurt anyone. And then suddenly he brings out like a loaded weapon. So he's right. a loose ca- he's a loose cannon. So I think what they should have done, although they should all face charges, the one that is the orchestrator of it, I think, should face the stiffest penalty. As Um, the federal prosecutor asked for, the federal prosecutor actually said he asked for 11 to 14 uh, years for three of the boys and 14 to 17 for Warren because he was seen as the ringleader. Yeah, that's what I think. He's the the ringleader's the one because the but the other if the others are stupid enough to go along with him, they obviously deserve you know time in jail anyway. But it seems from from the story that Spencer is not necessarily a bad person. It reeks to me of just students that are just fucking bored and have nothing to do. And it was kind of like an idea that actually got out of hand. And because you got someone like Warren, who's a loose cannon. He takes it to the next level, which was like inconceivably bad. Do yes. you know what I mean? Yes. And they probably got to a point where they were like, well, we're in it now. We've got to go through with this. We've got to carry on. Um, and probably shouldn't. Well, definitely shouldn't. There's no right. probably about it. And then unfortunately, the collateral damage was uh, was was BJ, BJ Gooch. But I mean, if they'd have just said, hey, let's go in the library, nick some books, see if we could sell them. Would the sentencing been a, a, as big as it was? Probably not. But like, as things started to unravel, that meant it. You know, the charges started building up because it got worse and worse, and they were getting themselves into more trouble. You know, we've all. I'm sure we've all gone into school. You know, when we were at school and done. You know, some things we shouldn't have done, but never no, nothing of that severity. I think when you reach the point of of making like physical violent physical contact with someone that yeah. that's yeah that's a you, there's no turning back from there really yeah yeah especially to old ladies and stuff that i literally she's probably it's probably a part-time job for her as well she's just there it's quiet she doesn't have to be on her feet all day and they go in there and they stab her with a with a you know a, a taser pen or whatever it was it's um although yeah. i should say um it's never too late to just turn yourself over yeah Exactly, but I think they thought to themselves. There's your uh, legal as, advice. Yeah, <laughs> I and mean, that's it. Take that legal advice. Do what you want with it. Um, but yeah, I think. I mean, I don't know. Is ten to fourteen years? Is that too much for something like that? I don't know. I think probably if you took out the fact that they physically assaulted someone, they might have got less. Um, but they'll probably be out by now, wouldn't they? If this was what this was like, what ten, twelve years ago, they might even some of them might even be out by now. I would say, okay, you're, you're, 
the, the thing is, because they organized to take it to New York to be valued, to be sold, they got, you know, Warren had gone to Amsterdam for a contact. It's, it's a pretty intricate chain of events, isn't it? If they'd have just gone in and said, right, we're going to steal some books and we'll decide what to do with them. They might even got away with a misdemeanor and not even done any jail time. But the fact that it was very well, well, on paper, it was very well planned. And then they went in to execute what they planned and then physically assaulted BJ Gooch. I would say, I'd say five, five, five years is fair. And I would say that maybe seven years for... Warren because he was a the ringleader and b probably the one that was more happy assaulting BJ Gooch than the others were. Mm. Am I close? You're pretty darn close. Really? You're actually on the money. Really? Before rendering her decision, the judge made preliminary findings. And those findings were that each of the boys was equally culpable. Yeah. Okay, so they're all going to get the same sentence. And the judge also rendered that this sentence would be uh, the value of the books would be all of the books that they intended on stealing, yeah. not just the ones that left the library. Right. The other finding was that BJ Gooch uh, suffered no bodily injury, but the stun pen was still a dangerous weapon. Yep. And because none of the boys offered to testify, they all said, we will not testify against each other. Yeah. She handed them identical seven-year sentences. Seven years. Okay. So I was almost on the money then. Yeah. So if they'd have, yeah. So if they had testified against each other, there's every chance that they would have got a lesser sentence. It's, yeah, totally. So they yeah. they got seven years. Yeah. Just from seeing a few books from your college library. Austin, that shows how things are going to unravel. It could have been a very different story for you had you actually, you know, in the, stolen that teacher's desk and put it in the tunnel underneath your school. I know. I know. It's true. I just, I, when I, when I heard about this story, when I read this story, I was, it just made me think how many moments in, in a young person's life are they, are they close to hanging out with that person who gets them yeah. into a bad idea or not saying no. And I just, yeah, I mean, I look, and things worked out. Uh, I guess, I guess things worked out okay for, for everyone involved, but, um, yeah. BJ yes. Gooch was able to buy herself some, probably some new furniture cause yeah. she had a bit of a payout. So yeah. Yeah. No, no massive harm done. Just a little bit of trauma for BJ Gooch, um, to overcome. That's right. Now, when the boys were in jail for two years, our story is almost ending here, Rich. But when yeah. the boys were in jail for two years, they, three of them, took place in a Vanity Fair interview. Right. So, so they're getting a bit of press. They're, they're getting, getting press. press. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the Vanity Fair interview is really, is really compelling. For anyone that's more interested in this story, you should definitely read the Vanity Fair interview. Okay. And I'll also add that there's a movie that came out in 2018, which oh, is really very called, cool. Which called what? Called American Animals. Right. It stars Evan Peters. Yeah. And uh, as Warren, and um, and the real the real uh, boys, the real four boys are also in it. They are also really? doing some interviews as well as the real BJ Gooch. Right. Okay. So it was included in my research, but I promise I also gave us some uh, some court documents and you know some of that yeah. some of that good Wikipedia stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. Basis of all research these days. When YouTube the guys did the Vanity Fair interview, the prosecutor got pissed. Mister Black says. The first two years, we had really been doing pretty good getting classes set up, and it was almost like a college curriculum for ourselves. Then yeah. we did the interview with Vanity Fair, and it completely set off the prosecutor. He yeah. had us all thrown in solitary confinement. After that, I had to deep dive into writing, split my days into reading, writing, and exercise. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Because... Really, they've done something pretty bad, and now they're being, you know, a movie's been made of them. They've like, you know, they're doing articles in major publications and stuff. Should that should that be happening? I don't think so. I don't think I'm so. I'm gonna send you here another cold read. Okay. And you're gonna give us an idea of what the heck these boys said in the Vanity Fair interview that okay. pissed off the prosecutor so much. 
Here it comes I'm on not, your WhatsApp. I'm not going to do it with the American accent this time. Okay, I'm just Rich, read if, it you, out. if you say so. This is this is Warren. This is Warren in Vanity Fair. He's already been in jail for two years. So this is what Warren said. In a few years, we'll be released. We'll all be still young. We will be stronger, better, wiser for going through this together, the three of us. Before, in college, growing up, we were being funneled into this mundane, nickel and dime existence. Now, we can't ever go back there. Even if we wanted to, they won't let us. That was the point all along. See, we have no choice but to create something new. Um, and then it carries on to say, uh, to create something new someplace else. Believe me, you haven't heard the last of us yet. Sounds a bit sinister, that. Sounds a bit sinister. Does not sound like someone who's sitting in jail and feeling any remorse for what they did. No, not at all. So I'm not surprised that the prosecutor was like, hey, these guys need to go down to some kind of like solitary confinement because clearly then they're, they're not really kind of ashamed of what they've done, especially Warren. But the thing about it is, I don't I, I don't think they should be allowed to get to profit from their story, to be honest, because it, it, it involved like a trauma to another person. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, you've... A lot of people say that you haven't seen The Last of Us and that really is the last we ever hear or see of them. So let's hope that's the case. Unless they show some kind of remorse and they do a bit of charity work or, I don't know, try and do something to help people rather than actually just be proud and brag about what they did. Well, the movie was filmed in 2018 after they were out of prison. And so uh, there's a little bit of a different tone there in some of those interviews. Warren went to Temple University and uh, he is now a prison reform advocate, claiming that when he was in prison, nothing was done to rehabilitate him or to help him. Right. And okay. so he's 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 working as a prison adv- uh, prison reform advocate. And Spencer is working as an artist. In fact, one of Spencer's paintings was allegedly used as the wallpaper screensaver for the FBI for a while. Really? Yeah. <laughs> my my, what a turn up for the books, quite literally. So there's our story. BJ Gooch, um, finally, you know, she was unsure about the movie, but when she took part in it and then watched the movie, she said um, she was really glad that the movie was made and how it was made and that it offered her, you know, um, it offered her some insight into, you know, what these guys were even thinking and if they were and um, that it's been a bit of a cathartic experience for her. So, so things ended better right. on a yes, she's better. She's retired now from the school, but things ended on a good note with BJ Gooch. Yeah. And um and I think the good thing is these guys have not become really celebrities, so there, there's yeah. no no glorifying what they did there, but it is a hilarious story. Yeah, it's ridiculous hilarious, which is exactly the kind of story we want on too good to be true crime, Austin. I loved hearing that story, mate. It and, was a bit um, of a long one, but thanks for thanks for offering your ear and and thanks for giving us your your judgment there at the end. I'm pretty impressed. It was very of judicial course, of you. I can only apologise for my horrific American accent earlier in the pod as well. Just bear with me. I was just trying to d- divulge the information. Um, it was great. Right, it was buddy. great. We gave you a hard challenge. We gave you a cold read, and 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 you took it in stride, buddy. It's got to be done, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Mate, we'll see you on the next uh, pod, won't we? Like, too good to be true crime. Like, subscribe, and all that other bollocks that we ask you to do. And, um, mate, I'll see you next time. Great to see you, Rich. See you soon. Too good. Too good to be true crime. Too good to be true. Too good. Too fucking good good to be true crime. It's true. Too good. Too good to be true crime. It's good. That's, 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 that's. Too good. Too fucking good to be true crime. That's all good shit.